awesome things that you didn't know. Three neat tricks with marine cranes. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. So why on earth would you build an entire ship to support just one crane? I mean, this question puzzled me the first time I saw an offshore construction vessel. The entire ship was designed around this single massive crane mounted on the aft deck. It looked like some huge Rube Goldberg contraption attempting to set a new record for the number of components that could break or wear down. At the time, I really couldn't understand what made that crane so special, or why it required an entire ship in support infrastructure. But it turns out that marine cranes create unique problems with some really interesting solutions. So today, I'm going to review three neat tricks that marine cranes employ. Ballast! <sighs> Most cranes employ some type of ballast to counteract the weight of the hook load. This is just blocks of heavy weight. It could be concrete or lead or iron. It's just weight. Ship cranes are no different, but our ballast comes cheap. We use massive ballast tanks filled with seawater. Seawater is free! Large crane barges and ships prepare for a lift by first filling all of the ballast tanks on the opposite side of the vessel. So if we were planning to pick up a load on the starboard side, we would first add ballast to the tanks on the port side. This increases the capacity of the ship, allowing it to lift heavier hook loads. It also creates an adjustable ballast that can perform fine-grained control over the heel angle of the ship while we're carrying the load. I love that. We have all of this amazing ability to change our crane's properties, and it all comes from free seawater. But what if something goes wrong? What if we were to suddenly lose that hook load? After all, accidents can happen. Now, our unbalanced ship is rapidly rolling to the counterballasted side. Uh-oh. Is it going to continue rolling and capsize? Nope. Counterballasting comes with another trick. Survival for this exact scenario. When we're designing the ship and sizing the ballast tanks, we do a whole bunch of simulations on the computer. And one of the things we simulate is this exact thing, a sudden loss of hook load. It may look violent in life and it will definitely be scary, but we make sure that that ship has sufficient reserve buoyancy to handle this rollback. The ship will survive. You may need to go sit down for a few minutes, but you're going to be alive for it. And the figure on your screen demonstrates this admirably. A ship was testing their new crane when the crane suddenly lost the hook load. That massive ship suddenly started rolling back towards the dock, generating gargantuan amounts of momentum, the kind of forces that could crush concrete. But the ship stopped itself and survived the accident. If you look at the picture, the ship is largely unharmed, and that is by design, not accident. The safety gets built into all of the load charts and the design of the ship. I love these types of safety systems. No extra equipment required, no fancy signs to read, it's all baked into the math. HUGE CRANES! As we graduate into major cranes, new complications arise. The majority of vessels only perform lifting operations in calm weather. It's a very key word there. If the waves are up and the wind is blowing, uh-uh, we're not lifting that day. Come back tomorrow. But the offshore oil and gas industry, well, they don't have that luxury. They frequently deploy large equipment, lowering it to the seabed on the open ocean in waves. Because when you get in the open ocean, there aren't many calm days. Those waves introduce a new level of complexity, dynamic forces. First, the waves bounce the ship, which is also bouncing the crane attached to the ship, which is then in turn pulling and bouncing the heavy load hanging off of our crane line. 
but this is no normal crane line. Lowering something down to the seabed means that we have a very long line. Our load is suspended a thousand meters down, hanging off of that crane below the water's surface. At that length, the minor stretch, the little elasticity of your crane line starts to add up. And suddenly this thing behaves like a giant spring. Imagine the world's biggest slinky. Hanging off of this crane, the hook and your attached equipment starts bouncing up and down a few meters. Yeah, go ahead, try doing precision placement now while it's bouncing around like a crazy wild horse. And we also have to worry about the line itself. This bouncing action creates dynamic forces 50 to 100% above the static weight of the load. So it might have said a thousand tons when you picked it up off the deck, but right now you're holding 2,000 tons of force. Except you're actually holding more than the 2,000 tons of force because that thousand meters of crane line also weighs quite a bit. So the weight of the crane line itself reduces the capacity of our hook load. All of those little factors add up to a big reduction. You might have a crane that started with a capacity of a thousand metric tons at the surface, but when you add up all of these factors and get all the way down to the seabed, you might only have 200 metric tons left to work with. And I think that's really neat that when we're dealing with offshore cranes, the simple act of pick a thing up and put it over here has turned into this massive, complicated, planned operation with all the precision of a NASA launch. The worst villain of them all, though, is the ship itself. The worst dynamic force comes from the ship. Now, this broke my brain the first time I thought about it. But that equipment that you're lowering through the water column, it doesn't like to move very fast, thanks to something we call added mass. Any rapid movements, like say bouncing around due to waves, create huge reaction forces due to all the water surrounding your equipment. This changes the behavior of the entire ship and crane system. Conceptually, we are not a free floating ship that's lowering a load. Our ship has anchored itself to a fixed point in the middle of the ocean through that crane line. Our load is the anchor. Back on the surface, the ship wants to rise and fall with the ocean waves, but the load on our crane hook resists that movement. Now, we have the entire ship trying to pull against this crane line. Huge dynamic forces. Well, that sounds like a really bad idea. And the solution is our cranes get much smarter. To reduce those dynamic forces, we add in something called active control. The basic goal behind active control is to isolate the hook load from ship motions. If the hook load moves slower, the dynamic forces get much smaller. And to achieve this, a computer senses the motions of the ship and calculates the resulting vertical motion at the tip of the crane boom. So we know how that boom is moving. The computer then compensates for that motion by automatically adjusting the line length. If the boom tip is rising 1.2 meters, huge hydraulic systems will kick in and very quickly pay out another 1.2 meters of crane line. This is not easy. It requires fast, powerful hydraulics and a complicated control system where our computer is basically predicting the future, or at least for a very short time into the future. Once we have all of that active control, fun things happen. The advanced cranes now break out several new options. We can turn it into active heave compensation, where the tip of the crane boom moves and the system compensates to hold the load at one position. This is useful when you're transitioning through the ocean surface or approaching the seabed. We want to do precision movements at those points. The other way we can use this is by throwing it into constant tension mode. The movement of the crane boom generates these massive dynamic forces, as we mentioned, jerking on the crane line. The computer adjusts the load position to minimize these dynamic forces and keep a constant tension on the crane line. That's useful when you're lowering through the water column because you want to avoid the risk of snapping the line. But this isn't perfect. Even the best active control system doesn't completely eliminate dynamic forces. 
There is no single solution to this problem. The engineering decisions behind a dynamic crane are at a complexity on par with the rest of the ship. You're going to devote a whole design team just to that crane. But for the right company, it's worth it. That complexity yields added capabilities. Stormy seas no longer hold us back. The risk of operating on a stormy day diminishes to become just a normal day at work. I wouldn't call it master of your elements, but it definitely gives you a competitive edge over the storm. Awesome. Ship stability with cranes depends on the height of the boom tip, not the height of the hook load. It's the boom tip. As you hold that boom at a very high angle, you're doing a lot to reduce your ship stability. Plus, that high boom tip creates a huge swing arc for any suspended weights, making them harder to control. These problems are why most ships come with cranes designed specifically for marine operations. And what makes them different is they have totally different configurations on their boom that are focusing on options for boom tip management. See, a typical land crane just uses one fixed boom that only pivots up or down. That's your luff angle. On marine cranes, we include extra methods that allow you to change the length of the boom, or at least change the height of the boom tip. The two most popular options are knuckle boom cranes and extendable booms. You can also see combination cranes that include both of these features. And as a bonus, these collapsible features also mean that the crane stores into a smaller deck footprint. Now you don't get this for free. That means more hydraulics, more pivot joints, it adds to the complexity and it adds to the cost. But the expense is justified because it gives you increased control, increased safety, and increased capacity. All things that we want. Control and safety. Those are the hallmarks of any good crane design. In the unpredictable environment of the ocean, control requires more effort. Creative solutions to new problems, things like counterballasting, dynamic cranes, and boom tip management. But every now and then, it's fun to step back and appreciate the innovation that allowed us to adapt industrial cranes to the marine environment. Thanks very much. I am Nick the Naval Architect. Sorry everybody, no kitschy catchphrase today, just some simple straight talk. Engineering is not about the ship. It's about what do you want to do with that ship. The future is focused on performance-based design. How are we going to use engineering solutions to turn this ship into an asset for your business goals? That is what DMS achieves. Engineered solutions for improved business performance in the marine field. If that sounds interesting to you, give us a call and let's see what we can do.